Duncan. Okay, welcome to the Origin and Evolution of the Moon course, the survey graduate level course. Um, and I'm uh, Jim Head and uh, with David Kring uh, here to uh, help introduce today's speaker. Uh, David Kring is actually at this moment out at Meteor Crater, Arizona in the field uh, at the end of the conference on uh, the uh, cratering conference. And so he's doing some really good science again. So press on, David, and uh, we'll pick up with that later on in a semester. So today, um, we're really fortunate to have with us Maria Zuber. Uh, Maria will talk to us today on the structure of the lunar crust, the mantle and the core. And uh, Maria, I'll say, is the E.A. Griswold Professor of Geophysics. Uh, but she's also the Vice President of Research uh, at MIT. Uh, and uh, those of you who know Maria know that she would have no problem uh, uh, essentially filling both those uh, jobs. Uh, Maria's research focuses on the structure and tectonics of solid solar system objects, and she specializes in using gravity and laser altimeter measurements uh, to determine the interior structure and evolution. Uh, and she's been involved in more than half a dozen uh, NASA planetary missions uh, aimed largely at mapping the moon, Mars, Mercury, as well as several asteroids. And uh, she's very importantly for the topic of today's um, seminar is that she was the principal investigator for the Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory mission, the GRAIL mission. Um, and as such, she became the first woman to lead a NASA spacecraft mission. Now, from Maria received her BA in Astronomy and Geology from the University of Pennsylvania, and then she also earned a science Master's of Science and a PhD degrees at Brown University under the uh, um, mentoring of uh, Dr. Mark Parmentier, whom we heard from last week. Uh, both of these degrees were in geophysics. She later worked at Johns Hopkins University and served as a research scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. And she joined the faculty of MIT in 1995, uh, where as chair of the Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences Department between uh, 2003 and 2012, she became the first woman the lead of science department at MIT. Um, we like to say that MIT needs women, Brown provides them. So we'll just go with that little plug. <laughs> so she's currently uh, MIT's vice president for research, as I mentioned above. So uh, Maria, in all of her duties here, is just coming out uh, momentarily here from. Okay, I'm here, Jim. <laughs> You're here. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> well, We'll come back to um, this uh, uh, schedule at, at the end of the discussion, but Maria, let me turn it over to you now with that introduction. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody out there in Obi, uh, Adobe Connect land. Okay, just trying to get the presentation uh, going. Okay. And please remember to start your webcam. Okay, can we do that? Should be sharing now. Okay. Okay, are we ready? All right. Yeah, and if you can just go ahead and close that uh, small window in the bottom right corner. We're all good. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I'm happy to be here. So, um, so I was asked to talk about the structure of the lunar crust, mantle, and core. Um, and I'm very happy to do so. And, um, um, and I'm, I'm going to do this from the standpoint of gravity and topography. So, um, so I decided that we only have an hour here and that I ought to um, kind of focus on what I know and I'm familiar with. So, um, so we're going to mainly be using results here from the GRAIL mission and from uh, the LRO mission with, uh, with lower topography. So, um, so let me start here with um, a pre uh, pre-grail model of our notional idea of the lunar interior. So, um, so we we had a sense that um, uh, the moon has a, a different crustal structure on the near side versus the far side. So, on the um, 
this is this is I should say a, a graphic that was adapted by a paper that um, Mark Wozorek and colleagues um, developed in um, in a 2007 review paper. So um, so on the the near side where we have the Maria, um, the the crust is thinner. On the far side, we have a, a thicker crust. Um, we know from analysis of the Apollo samples, followed by spectral information, that that crust is uh, aluminum rich. It's a north acidic. Uh, there is a, a mantle. There's some questions um, about whether or not there's a discontinuity in the mantle. Um, the uh, moment of inertia data um, indicates that um, that the moon is not entirely homogeneous in the interior in terms of the radial density distribution, uh, but it's pretty close to that. And uh, but the uh, the moment of inertia data allows for a, uh, a, a, a an iron core. Um, there is some indication from the. Uh, uh, the K2 value, the solid tide, that the, that there is some dissipation there, which indicates that there is uh, some melting um, at some point. But there, you know, beyond that, there is a, a, a fair amount of question um, about uh, uh, exactly what uh, the details are, and, um, and so we um, we meant to address that. So um, so as I said. Um, I'll be uh, looking at this question um, from the standpoint of, uh, of geophysics, and, um, and the approach that we'll be taking is to use a, a gravity model, and uh, the gravity model is from GRAIL, a uh, topography model um, from uh, the LOLA uh, instrument on LRO, and, um, and when we have gravity and topography, we can put that together and develop a geophysical model, and um, and uh, and I'll explain how we do some of this. But uh, we um, can extract parameters um, with some assumptions uh, to provide us with things that are interesting about the interior of the moon. Um, those being uh, crustal thickness, crustal density, porosity, um, which tell us about uh, composition and about constitution, then elastic thickness, which tells us um, about the thermal state. Um, we can say, say something about uh, loads, and these can be loads on the surface, um, such as uh, the Mari fill inside the largest impact basins is the most obvious manifestation of that on the moon. Um, there are also subsurface loads, which uh, correspond to um, thinning of the mantle beneath major impact basins, uh, where um, low density crust is replaced in a crustal column by higher density mantle. Um, we can look at things like the ratio between surface loads and subsurface loads and the phase relationship of those loads, and they can um, tell us things about the mechanism of compensation. So, um, so a couple of important things that I need to say here, and, uh, and that first of all, um, uh, gravity and topography models uh, provide you with uh, representations of the interior of a planetary body, um, and these are, these are non-unique. Okay, so I can come up with essentially an infinity of solutions that satisfy um, a, uh, a topographic field and a gravity solution, um, but virtually all of those solutions that I can come up with will be unrealistic. And so it is, um, it is absolutely essential um, that we provide uh, additional sources of information um, in order to narrow the number of uh, physically plausible solutions um, as much as possible. And so we use um, information from geochemistry, from petrology, from geology. Um, we lo use lunar samples where that we have them. We use magnetic information where we have that. 
Um, it, we use uh, an abundance of remote sensing data, and um, and it's not going to be uh, a topic of today's lecture because it's certainly worth um, another lecture in its own right. But um, but you know I think personally one of the most important things that uh, the Grail data and the the Lola data um, combined together uh, have provided was um, really uh, an outstanding um, geodetic grid um, of the moon um, so that, uh, that it's possible to um, what I'll call selenolocate um, data sets um, from many different missions and that inclu includes current and recent missions but also historical missions um, and put those all in the same coordinate system in the same reference frame. And so, um, and so one can look at all the data that one has in a certain area um, together and, um, and that really um, increases the value of those data sets. Also, because of the fact that we can uh, calculate orbits very accurately um, now uh, for the moon, um, it also allows us to target um, uh, observations uh, that we obtain now. So, um, so for example, we, you know, I talked to uh, Mark Robinson, um, who uh, is the PI of the LROC camera that's on LRO, and um, uh, he uh, he is able to tar target uh, places where he takes images now so much more accurately now after having the Grail data um, than he was at the beginning of the LRO mission where he didn't have either Grail or Lola data. So, um, so that's important to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that I wanted, wanted to mention at this point um, before I move uh, forward is, um, is that uh, I will be um, presenting um, uh, observations and, and interpretations and, um, and that a, a whole a lot of people um, deserve credit for this. So while it's it's uh, the presentation is coming from me, um, the the number of uh, colleagues at at uh, you know different uh, academic institutions and their postdocs and their students, um, and then all of the uh, um, uh, analysis staffs and uh, engineers who operated the mission, who um, provided all the corrections to the data. Um, all deserve um, a great deal of credit for um, for what you're going to see today. So, um, so as I show you some of these things, I'm, I'll try to remember to um, to mention um, who deserves the bulk of the credit for the the observations and interpretations. But uh, um, but in case I uh, fall short and forget on some of those, let me you know just give as much credit as I can give to. Um, to many team members and, and actually, you know, many members of the extended scientific community whose, whose data sets were added to this and helped inform things and, and even, you know, those who um, uh, really just wanted to act, who have asked questions and caused us to, to think um, more critically about, uh, about what we, the data that we've obtained and, and how we interpret it. So, um, so let's move on and, um, and so I thought I'd start before we um, get into the beautiful data imagery, is um, is to um, is to begin with um, with a, a spectrum. So um, so uh, I'll spend the bulk of the time here um, talking about what we've learned about the crust of the moon and um, and um, and our advances there uh, really. Uh, came about, I mean, this is where I think that we've done um, the truly, truly um, transformative work. And, um, and the reason uh, that uh, we have been able to transform our understanding of the lunar crust is, um, is that there are basically two reasons uh, associated with the GRAIL mission. And, um, and the first is the fact that we, we were able to orbit very low, so we, uh, we had two spacecraft that were in orbit around the moon um, and mapped the moon for, for several cycles at a mean altitude of 50 kilometers, and then we took it down to a mean altitude of 
22 and a half kilometers, and then uh, then we took it down to a mean altitude of 11 kilometers. And when we were map mapping the moon and orbiting at 11 kilometers, um, in places we got to within um, uh, a couple of kilometers of the lunar surface. And so that when you're that low, um, you can map at very high resolution. And then the other reason, of course, is the um, is the uh, just the quality of the data. And um, and so we were. Uh, able to um, measure velocity changes of uh, uh, just a handful of uh, uh, tenths of a micron per second in velocity, um, which which means that we were able to map very very subtle signals. So um, so arguably um, the uh, the figure on the left there is uh, um, is is one of the most surprising things that we learned about the, the Grail mission. So that is a plot of, uh, of a parameter called um, coherence. Um, and coherence is, uh, is basically a comparison of, uh, of the gravity um, that, that one observes with the gravity um, if the entire gravity signal were due to topography. Okay? And, um, and so that is plotted as a function of spherical harmonic degree, which is on the x-axis. And over on the left-hand side, the low degrees uh, are long wavelengths um, and um, out to about degree 15 or 20 or so uh, correspond to wavelengths associated with major impact basins on the moon. And then as we go out to the far right, um, and high degrees and orders that corresponds to um, very shallow um, areas of the, the lunar crust, and um, and so um, so what you see there is a coherence spectrum, um, one for Grail, um, which is in the blue, and then in a lighter green is. Uh, from Grail uh, combined with the LOLA data, um, you can see that bec between what I say degrees and orders 80 and uh, uh, 650, which is a, um, a spatial scale range, which is a half wavelength between 8 and uh, 70 kilometers, 98 and a half percent of the gravity that we see is due to surface topography. Um, so at these spatial scales, there's almost no gravity coming from variations um, in internal structure. And then over on the right-hand side, um, we blow that up um, a little bit um, and, uh, and look at it in more detail. And you can see the difference between the near side and the far side. And, um, and the far side is more coherent than the near side. And, um, and what that means is that there's there are less density variations within the far side crust than within the uh, the near side crust. So you're really seeing um, uh, effects of, uh, I think I say, Mari in the subsurface um, uh, there. And um, and so um, so how do we interpret this? So we have um, we have interpreted this that the only way that the crust could be that homogeneous that it isn't uh, that, that we just aren't seeing uh, lateral density variations is if the crust has been um, pervasively pervasively fractured nearly to the point of being pulverized and homogenized in that way. So I think on the next hand slide we have a pictorial um, version of uh, of what that coherence spectrum looks like. So um, so so this. This was another tremendously um, uh, surprising thing. So on the left-hand side is the far side of the moon, and it's a LOLA topography map. And on the right-hand side um, is a Grail gravity map. And um, and uh, and of course the units are different. One is topography, uh, one is uh, milligals. Um, but uh, but what you can see is that these two maps um, are nearly Identical, okay, and um, and so uh, so this is just another way of saying 
that at short wavelengths associated um, with, uh, you know, small scale craters um, to, uh, to mid scale um, impact structures that, that basically um, you're seeing uh, that uh, nearly all of the gravity um, that we see is, uh, is due to the topography. So that could, um, that could have led one, and, and believe me, the question has been asked. In fact, the last MIT president, when I showed her these maps, she said, so, um, so, if all the, all, so if these two maps look alike and all the gravity is due to topography, why did you need to do the gravity mission? Why couldn't you just have taken the topography and converted it to gravity? And, uh, and I said, well, you would have never thought to do that because you wouldn't have known. And, um, and if, if I had done that, people would have said, you're assuming things. And, um, and uh, of course, uh, we weren't. So that's, that is uh, one of the first important results. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna show some of the other um, derived um, data sets now that we get. So first of all um, is uh, the free air gravity that's associated with the GRAIL mission. So, um, so you're going to see several um, figures like this, and um, and so um, uh, what you see here, this is a, um, I believe a mile wide uh, projection, where on um, the right hand side is the the near side of the moon. So this is the side we see from Earth. I know we all know this if you're on this uh, telecon, um, you know about the synchronous uh, state of the moon. Um, on the left-hand side um, is the far side of the moon, and um, and you can see the greater amount of rich short wavelength um, detail there that is associated with the um, the bombardment um, of uh, of Highlands Crust, and um, um, and uh, the uh, uh, the large red areas on the the near side are. Um, are the mascons that were um, first discovered um, by uh, a spacecraft that uh, orbited the moon, um, searching for good places to land people um, for the Apollo mission. But we now um, know that those um, those mascons um, correspond to um, uh, a combination of. Uh, Uplifted mantle, and we'll, we'll see some cross sections later that show this, um, uh, and associated um, filling of uh, mare basalts um, uh, into um, the, the basins associated with with uh, the large impacts. Okay, the next uh, the next chart here is the Lola topography model. Um, this is a degree and order um, uh, 20, 25 uh, hundred um, model. I should have said for the the gravity that um, that our um, our best solution in gravity is out to degree in order um, 1800, um, which is well. Let me go back here. Um, degree in order 1800. I'm showing it out here to um, 720. Um, we don't have a screen resolution that can um, uh, show a global model and resolve all the detail. Um, so that uh, that corresponds to a, uh, um, a spatial resolution of about uh, 2.7 um, kilometers, um, but it's not that good everywhere, um, uh, and that's because um, uh, the moon has different elevations, and the spacecraft got within um, uh, different distances of the surface, and also we have better coverage. At the poles, because the spacecraft were in polar orbit, um, than we do um, at the equator. Okay, in the, uh, the topography model, um, we, we again um, the uh, cross track resolution here um, goes with the uh, the cosine of latitude, and I believe at uh, uh, in equatorial regions now, the um, uh, we actually have. Uh, in most places, um, when we make a gridded data set out of this, uh, uh, it goes as much as uh, 300 meters um, spatial resolution. Okay, so um, so the next chart here is um, is Bouguer gravity. So if we want to know what's going on in the inside of the moon, we have to subtract away the gravitational attraction of topography. 
And so that's what's done um, in this figure here. Um, and and what you see is so this is this is this is gravity just associated with what's going on in the inside of the moon. And so what you see here is we have lost all of that fine detailed um, structure um, associated with the, the free air gravity map um, because um, because most of that gravity was uh, at short wavelengths was associated with uh, with uh, the uh, relief associated with impact basins. So here, um, here you see that uh, we see mantle uplift in many places um, that is associated with the impact basins. We see some pretty interesting things going on um, associated with the um, uh, surrounding the, the near side Mari basins, and we'll talk in more detail about that. Um, now again, we can't fit it in this talk, but let me just say that because um, we see uh, all these mantle uplift signatures in red. Um, it's possible to go in and do um, a, an essentially definitive count of the size distribution of ancient impacts on the moon. So sometimes old impacts can be obliterated by other impacts, um, but uh, but when we um, you know, scrape away the attraction of uh, surface topography. We can see beneath the surface, and so we now have um, we now have uh, um, uh, work that Greg Newman led for us with a, a map of the distribution of impact basins. So, um, so we um, we can now um, use uh, the Bouguer gravity to tell us. Um, something about uh, what the density of the crust is. So let me um, let me explain this to you. So um, so this is a plot of a parameter called admittance, um, and admittance is plotted on the uh, ordinate. And again, spherical harmonic degree is uh, um, uh, plotted along the abscissa. And um, and the admittance is uh, like the coherence. It's another transfer function between gravity and topography. And the admittance is a essentially a cross uh, product between uh, gravity and topography divided by um, topography crossed with itself. So at um, at uh, very short wavelengths, um, the Bouguer gravity that we see. Um, is associated with um, crustal density. So, so if we let's just say if we pick the right density of the crust at short wavelengths, we should have no Bouguer gravity anomaly. And so, um, so we can actually use uh, the Bouguer anomaly um, to tell us what the density of the crust is, and we do that by um, Assuming different crustal densities, and then using the one that minimizes the correlation between Bouguer gravity and topography. Okay, and then we um, we can figure out actually how the <coughs> excuse me how the density varies as a function of depth um, by looking at different spherical harmonic degree ranges because um, the uh, um, the uh, spatial resolution at the surface basically corresponds to the same um, depth range. Okay, so the next uh, slide basically shows how we do this. So this shows the power of the Bouguer gravity um, on the ordinate as a function of spherical harmonic degree. And as we go out to higher and higher degrees, we, that corresponds to shallower and shallower depths. And that, those, what you see there is a bunch of different um, calculations for what the Bouguer power spectrum looks like, um, assuming different densities. And those densities are given there at the top of the chart. And we can, um, so I've blown them up in a couple of different areas, um, just showing for the upper crust, and then we can make a different um, uh, estimation um, for the lower crust. And then, um, then we can actually pull out different um, degree ranges, and then we can look at how the density varies um, as, a, as a function of uh, at, at different depth slices. So, um, 
So here is here is the density at the surface, and um, and here I've um, subtracted away the density of the maria. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And um, and so um, what we found here, and this this was another surprise, um, is that the uh, average um, crustal thickness of the or the exact excuse me the average crustal density of the lunar highlands is um, is about 2550 kilograms per meter cubed. And, um, and this was um, less than um, the density that had been um, assumed before, which was out of 2650, you know, in some cases 2700 kilograms per meter cubed. Um, we can look at this, um, the crustal density at uh, different depths. So here I've pulled out um, the uh, uh, stroke harmonic range of uh, 250 to 500, which corresponds to a, a block size or a depth of uh, 10 to 22 kilometers. So this uh, this gives us uh, um, a uh, a lower um, is some information lower um, in the crust, and so you can get uh, get a sense for that. So. And I want to emphasize to everybody uh, when you look at these charts in more detail later that the um, the um, uh, color uh, ranges for the densities um, are different. So um, so around um, the major impact basins, you see that there are uh, lower densities, and you can see that um, somewhat at the surface as well. Um, but in areas where uh, we have mare, um, of course. Uh, that is influencing the, influencing the crustal density um, as well. Um, we can then go um, uh, lower into the lower crust. Um, uh, and um, so here we pulled out the range 150 to 310. And um, you know, the crustal density is getting greater um, from greater compaction. Um, there could be some compositional changes there, um, but um, probably less fracturing um, as well. And, um, and so then we can make a, uh, we can make a plot now of the uh, crustal density as a function of depth by um, pulling uh, information at different parts of that uh, Bouguet gravity spectrum out of there. And, um, and so this, this I think shows um, pretty clearly um, this uh, average density uh, for the crust of about uh, 2550 uh, for parts of the crust. So, so on this plot, you see um, spherical harmonic degree on the bottom, and then um, and then depth within the crust um, along the top of the abscissa, and um, and so when we're down at um, you know depths of greater than 45 kilometers, uh, you can see that. Things are very variable and they're very complicated. And the reason for that is that at those depths, um, part of its crust, some of the time you're seeing crust, some of the times you're seeing mantle. Uh, it, you know, some of, you, you're in highlands for part of the time. You're under impact basins um, at uh, at other times, and you have a mixing of uh, crust. Uh, and impact melt in other areas. So, um, as we approach the shallowest depths, um, you can see that the um, that the crustal density gets even lower. Um, and um, and so there's a combination of things going um, on here. So, um, so of course the the density is getting less because there's less compaction. And there's more small impacts that are fracturing um, the crust. Um, if we went out to you know even higher degrees in order, um, we might argue that there is a, a sampling issue that we're not sampling all the wavelengths out there. But um, but with the uh, Grail gravity and and uh, low uh, topography um, out at um, uh, spherical harmonic degrees of 400 and and 10 kilometers depth. Um, we we have those fully sampled, so we I, I think we pretty much completely um, understand the data there. So there there are no data shortcomings um, in uh, in um, that wavelength or that spatial scale range. Okay, so um, so then 
if we, um, so we know the crustal density now, and if we, um, if we have crustal density, and if we, um, if we know or we can make a reasonable estimation of grain size, um, then we can convert and say something about the porosity. And so that, uh, you see that map here. So this, uh, again, this is in a crustal depth range of 10 to 22 kilometers. And, um, and the average porosity of uh, the crust of the moon is somewhere, um, it, you know, at shallower depths of around 12% um, uh, around or so. Um, you can see that the uh, porosity is the greatest around um, the large impact basins. Uh, this is not surprising because uh, we have ejecta there, which um, is lower in density, and this is also an area that's more fractured. Um, I haven't seen this work done yet, but if there's anybody out there, uh, if there are any graduate students out there who are thinking about an interesting um, thesis project, uh, the idea of um, really using um, this porosity information to, um, to uh, help us inform um, the way energy is partitioned in large impacts, uh, I think there's some additional constraints here that we didn't have before. So, um, so of course, in, in a uh, planet scale impact, um, some of the energy goes into compressing the target, uh, some, some of it goes into digging a hole, uh, some of it goes into fracturing, some of it goes into vaporization, uh, ejecta throw out, and if, uh, if the impact is large enough, some of, them, some of it can go into changing the spin of the planet even. Um, but, um, but the information that we have here from the porosity tells us uh, something about the way that material um, has been thrown out and how much it's been fractured. So there's, there's a way that um, one can use this information to, to tell us about how energy is partitioned at large impacts. So here we can go now um, deeper um, into the crust and, and even into parts of the upper mantle, um, looking at the porosity and of course the, um, there, even at lower parts of the crust, um, there's still a fairly, um, fairly high um, porosity. So this, this idea of a, uh, of a fractured, uh, a very, very fractured um, lunar crust, I think, is um, uh, arguably one of the things that, uh, the most important things that has come out of the GRAIL mission. Okay, so we've done crustal density and we've done um, porosity, and, um, and so now um, the next thing that we can calculate is uh, crustal thickness, and this is a, a crustal thickness map. Um, we've known since the time of Apollo um, that the, uh, the crust on the far side of the moon is on average thicker than the near side of the moon. Um, that's with the exception of the South Pole Aiken Basin, um, which you can see on the southern hemisphere of the lunar far side. Um, what, we, um, what we have been able to determine um, here is um, you know, making different assumptions. The average crustal thickness of the moon turns out to be between 34 and 43 um, kilometers. And, um, and this is, uh, um, you know, back when I started learning about the interior of the moon, the average crustal thickness of the moon was 60 kilometers. And, um, and it uh, came down somewhat after that, but um, considerably um, less than researchers were thinking. And, um, and of course, the reason for that is that we had the crustal density wrong. And so we needed more crust to account for the variations in the gravity signal that we thought. And, um, and so because we had the crustal density wrong, we had the crustal thickness wrong, and so we had the crustal volume wrong, and, um, and so this has some implications for, um, for bulk composition. So, um, so here's, um, so, so before we talk about bulk composition, though, I wanted to um, just um, mention here, uh, just show you a comparison of, uh, of crustal densities that we, um, uh, and crustal porosities that have come out of GRAIL data um, and, um, and a comparison there with, uh, with um, lunar samples. 
and um, and uh, I want to um, actually I want to do a, a shout out to the the Cap 10 people now because um, prior to um, uh, Grail prior prior and concurrent to um, to Grail um, entering into orbit around the moon um, we were able to uh, get a hold of some lunar samples and do uh, more density and porosity measurements of the lunar samples to, um, to um, as what we thought was going to be a constraint on the GRAIL data, but it turned out very much to be a, a comparison to what we were getting out of the GRAIL data. And, um, and so uh, Ryan Ziegler, um, you know, thank you very much for this, but Walter Kiefer from our team um, led that analysis. And, um, and so, uh, so what was really interesting is that we got um, global results out of GRAIL gravity and lower topography um, that matched up pretty well with, um, with measurements that were made um, from, uh, from lunar samples. So that was a, that was a nice result. Um, so now um, let's talk about um, the implications of our new bounds on crustal thickness for the bulk um, composition um, of the moon. And, um, and so um, on the ordinate here is the um, AL203 content in the mantle um, plotted against crustal thickness. And, um, and so, um, so uh, on the top there, the red line is, uh, is what the um, bulk, if the bulk moon lunar, um, essentially AL203 composition was one and a half times that of the Earth. And the uh, blue line there is if the composition was the same as Earth. Um, we have some constraints from Mari basalts, and now we know what the average crustal thickness is, and it um, it essentially um, falls in the range of um, of the uh, the Moon's bulk um, AL203 um, being the same as the Earth. So um, so essentially, um, if we know the amount of um, aluminum in the crust, uh, we can estimate the amount of aluminum in the mantle by, um, by looking at the partitioning during melting. And uh, we also have estimates from, uh, from Mari Basalt. So it puts the picture together for us. So, um, so there have been a whole, these are, this is a, um, a result that was a uh, figure that was put together um, by, uh, by uh, Jeff Taylor from the, uh, the GRAIL team. And this is just number of papers um, estimating where the aluminum content of the moon was either Earth-like or enriched uh, um, relative to the Earth. And, um, and uh, uh, Jeff, you know, because of the crustal thickness data and crustal volume that we got out of that, Jeff was able to um, eliminate the um, uh, the refractory enrichment um, of the moon relative to Earth and show that the moon's aluminum was actually Earth-like. Um, and Jeff was quick to say that the papers that he had written on this topic are the ones under the red X. So, um, so that um, uh, he was actually happy to prove his previous work wrong um, on that. But, um, but since we know now um, that the moon's bulk aluminum is similar to the Earth, this, um, this is interesting because it actually provides a constraint on um, uh, models of the giant impact. So what this does is it favors um, models of the, uh, the giant impact of the collision that uh, the target and um, the impactor are well mixed. So, um, so this is uh, you know, shortly after we wrote this paper, um, a paper, or, or maybe just before, uh, a paper by uh, uh, Robin Canop came out um, uh, suggesting that instead of uh, um, uh, a body, a Mars-sized impactor hitting the Earth, that maybe something Earth-sized hitting the Earth um, could work better and would mix the target more effectively. Um, there are also other ways of uh, doing it by uh, Cook et al. Um, with a smaller impact uh, and, uh, and a higher rotational velocity. So there, there are different ways to do it, but, um, but uh, so this uh, information on bulk composition um, 
uh, has, you know, at least provided us with some new constraint then on, um, on uh, models of uh, the formation of the Earth-Moon system. Okay, uh, let's see, I think we're, we're getting to the, um, well, we're kind of uh, starting to address the mantle um, now, but um, the, the last, I think, kind of crustal thing that I wanted to talk about is um, a, uh, a paper that came out this year by, um, by my former graduate student, Mike Sori, um, trying to look at the, um, the compensation of lunar crust. So, um, so um, he, you know, back using Apollo era data, um, Sean Solomon in the early part of his career um, uh, did a test to see whether lunar, um, lunar topography was um, compensated uh, in an airy sense by uh, crustal thickness variations or in a Pratt sense, which means lateral density variations. And, um, and of course, we now have much better data on that. And so, um, so Mike wanted to go back and have a look at that with two really high quality data sets. And perhaps not surprisingly, because of the hom homogenization of um, the lunar crust that was indicated by the coherence that I showed you, um, uh, it came out again that uh, that Pratt isostasy or lateral density variations are not what's holding up lunar topography. So Mike used um, uh, geoid to topography ratios of the the near and the far side. So um, so the near side and the far side of the moon have distinctively different um, uh, uh, estimates of uh, geoid to topography. Um, the estimates that you come out with um, turn out to be pretty independent of uh, the size of the window that one looks like. And, um, and so having um, these geoid to topography ratios, uh, one can um, compare the observations to what ratios would be predicted um, by different compensation models. So you can vary crustal density, crustal thickness, different compensation models, and, um, and see what matches. And so, um, and so what, uh, what Mike was able to show is that flexural compensation basically just doesn't work. So, um, so it means that, um, that, the, that the moon didn't have flexural strength. It didn't have a considerable um, elastic thickness um, at the time that uh, the um, uh, that the the bulk of the topography formed. Um, instead, um, he found that the the uh, geoid to topography ratios were consistent with um, with an area compensation model, but one where isostasy is defined um, by a constant pressure at an equal potential surface at depth. And so, um, so the um, the, uh, without going into this in a, a lot of detail, it, it indicates that the, at least the long wavelengths of topography on the moon um, uh, were compensated by crustal thickness variations and, um, and uh, really is a statement that highland topography formed um, extremely early in lunar history um, before there really was any um, thick elastic um, lithosphere. Okay. Um, Let's see, another thing that we can look at for the moon then is, uh, is gravity gradients. And um, so if we take the, essentially the derivative um, of, uh, of um, the gravity field and, um, and we look at eigenvalues for that, um, we can look in some detail and we see structures um, that we don't see uh, when we just look at the, the gravity field itself. So, um, so this is work that was led by um, Jeff Andrews Hanna uh, on the faculty at, uh, at the LPL at the University of Arizona. And, um, and Jeff was able to identify um, uh, lineations that were not, that are not visible in any surface data set. Okay. And, um, and so uh, Jeff and his students, um, looked at topography, they looked at spectral data, um, they, they looked at uh, all the surface data sets, uh, they looked at, at many images, 
And, um, and what you see are lineations here that, that are just not visible um, at the surface. And, um, and so what these uh, essentially correspond to are um, subsurface dikes. Um, and here's, a, here's an earth um, analog um, of, uh, of these dikes. And, um, and the dikes that uh, Jeff identified um, were between um, you know, 5 and 25 uh, kilometers across in terms of width, and that they penetrated from the upper crust um, or from the, excuse me, from the um, mid-crustal levels um, into upper mantle um, levels, down to as much as um, 80 kilometers. And, uh, and again, here's, um, uh, here's uh, a Bouguer gravity map where you don't really see these. Uh, here's a gradient map, and then here's a, a map of all of these. And what was interesting is, um, so these, they're not in any spatial pattern. Um, and, uh, and they represent evidence for an early um, thermal expansion um, of the moon. And, um, and this actually had been predicted um, in a paper by uh, Sean Solomon, and um, no evidence had ever been observed for that. It wasn't clear uh, whether the moon hadn't undergone um, thermal expansion or, um, or else whether or not there was, it happened so early that just the subsequent bombardment of the lunar crust uh, didn't preserve them. And in fact, um, we don't see these things very shallow. And I think the, the impact homogenization of the crust has, uh, has uh, wiped out that signal. I, I think we, we don't know that these came to the surface. We don't see them. Um, but, um, but given the highly impacted nature of the um, lunar crust, we wouldn't expect to see them. Um, we can use that uh, the gradiometry data for other things as well. Um, we, um, uh, Jeff led another study um, uh, looking at um, what do we see uh, under the uh, Mari basins. So, um, so we see that uh, most of the erupted um, lava um, on the moon is, uh, is, it represents the Mari basalts. Um, we know from looking at uh, uh, thorium concentrations um, and other heat-producing elements that um, uh, we've identified Procolarum creep terrain um, on the moon, um, which is highly enriched in these heat-producing elements. And we know that the regional temperature in that area uh, is higher than um, average. So, um, so wanting to look beneath the lunar maria, here's a topography map and a thorium map showing the high concentrations there. Um, there's a Bouguer um, gravity map which shows some hint of something going on. But then, um, then if we compare, uh, so here's a, a maria-centered um, map and uh, with uh, with gradients shown and um, what this. Uh, what you see there um, are essentially um, cooling cracks that are um, associated with um, with the mantle plume that we believe um, was uh, um, beneath the uh, the Mari basalts. So um, so and it turns out that um, Jeff looked very carefully um, at uh, superposition relationships and was able to um, constrain um, the timing of uh, when these uh, uh, got close to the surface. Um, so, um, so in the eastern border, they uh, predate Serenitatis. Um, and so they're pre-Nectarian. In the southern border, um, they're uh, Nectarian. And so it, so it indicates that this happened over hundreds of millions of years. So these occurred after over um, an extended period of time. And, um, and again, the, uh, the angular relationships of this uh, quasi-pentagonal um, shape, which um, uh, are angles that what you would expect cooling, cooling cracks um, to look at, uh, to look like um, if they were on a sphere. So, um, so essentially what you're seeing here is the, um, the plumbing system um, of the, the Mari basalts. And um, so then um, we can uh, look at the lunar maria, and um, and we can use um, both uh, 
geoid topography ratios and um, uh, buried craters, um, which can be determined from a uh, grail um, to constrain um, the thickness of the Mare basalts. So, um, so they're on average uh, about a kilometer thick, and they uh, Mare basalts can get up to seven to ten kilometers thick. This is separate work that was done by um, my former student Alex Evans, who's now in the faculty of Brown, and uh, uh, Gong Mozorik, who did the GTR method. Um, they agreed um, reasonably well using the same data sets, but different um, different kinds of analyses. Um, uh, we're also able to um, determine the uh, um, uh, something about the submare mantle. Um, they are denser uh, than highland um, mantle. They're, they're really similar to Mari basalt. So you're seeing evidence here for mafic um, unfractured uh, melt sheet. Um, finally, looking at the, um, uh, we can use the gradiometry to say something about the structure of impact basins. And this is just a model of Oriental. And using the gradiometry and doing models of the, the uh, uh, anomaly um, patterns, um, uh, we see that there's evidence that the large ring faults around the major basins actually actually extended um, into the mantle. Again, um, and the porosity models um, that we developed, if we extend them into the mantle, allow for up to 6% porosity in the upper mantle. So this impact bombardment history um, is really substantial. So, um, so we'll move on now to the, um, uh, the to the study of the deep interior, and what are the parameters that are relevant to the um, to the study of deep interior structure. So we need um, an accurate mass, and so the point mass um, we can't um, uh, we can't distinguish from G. So we solve for um, GM. We need the mean lunar, lunar radius. We need the mean density. Um, we need the second degree in order gravity field coefficients, so the flattening of the gravity field. And the C22 is basically the gravitational shape of the equator. And, um, and so we also bring in um, lunar laser ranging data to get the mean solid moment of inertia and then um, the, the love number, which is the gravitational tide. And um, before uh, GRAIL, we really thought that the um, uh, the, the K2, the improved K2 value, um, was was going to be the most important thing to us. But but uh, but actually, we, um, uh, we we made an even greater um, improvement in the um, mean solid moment of inertia from the uh, low degree gravitational coefficients, which really helped us in our interior modeling. So we basically do models of the deep interior structure, and so this this was done. Uh, this is um, from Isamu Matsuyama on our team. Um, Jim Williams, of course, also played a very critical um, role um, in this effort. Uh, James Keene, a graduate student, was also, at the time, uh, now a postdoc at Caltech, was also extremely um, influential um, in all this work, uh, as were others. Um, but um, what you see there is a plot of the uh, liquid core size to the solid core size um, and, um, and just using the constraints that we have and putting reasonable uncertainties associated with them um, and running a whole lot of Monte Carlo inversions, um, you see the range of plausible solutions pre-GRAIL pre and from GRAIL. And, um, and so we, we need to make assumptions here. We assumed a solid core a liquid outer core and then a partial melt zone or a low velocity layer at the base of the mantle. And, um, and then um, uh, on the next slide, um, this chart, these are the plots of probability density functions um, where the, the blue is the range of allowable solid core sizes, the green is the liquid outer core sizes, and the um, uh, the, the red is the, the mantle uh, zone of melting, and you can uh, see the uh, um, pre-grail and grail solutions. So, um, so again, um, uh, the improvements in both the, um, the uh, gravitational tide, the K2, and the mean moment of inertia were critical in improving these solutions. So then the best fit models were 
leave us with a, an outer fluid core radius of between 200 and 380 kilometers, an inner solid core of less than 280 kilometers, um, which is, you know, a mass fraction of uh, a percent or less, um, you know, a, a low speed zone, and then the mass fraction of the entire core is less than a percent and a half of the, the lunar mass. Um, and all solid core of the moon is um, improbable. So, um, so, so the last thing I wanted to mention is, is just to, um, to um, contemplate what we've learned going back to the lunar crust um, from a comparative planetological perspective. So, um, so this is, again, a plot of coherence as a function of spherical harmonic degree uh, for different terrestrial planets. So blue is the moon. Red is Mars, yellow is Venus, green is the Earth, uh, and, uh, and in there, orange is Mercury, which uh, you, you can't see too, too well. And what you see here is um, none of the other terrestrial planets look like the moon um, in terms of, so that flat coherence pattern there um, is, again, indicative of a very fractured upper crust. So. Um, so not every planet should look like the moon. So Earth has plate tectonics, um, you know, the, so, uh, and it has crust, and uh, it has continental crust, it has um, oceanic crust, uh, and it has an atmosphere, so the crust is, we wouldn't expect the crust to be that broken up. Venus has a very, very thick atmosphere. Um, and, um, and also has been volcanically resurfaced, as has the, um, at least the uh, seafloor of the Earth. So if it was fractured, it would have infilled. Um, but Mars um, and Mercury, um, actually, we might expect those to be like the moon. And, and especially for, uh, for Mars, uh, we might expect the crust to be a lot more fractured than we might have thought before based on what we've seen from the moon. And Mars doesn't look that way. And the question that, that I'll leave you with um, is, uh, is the moon just very special and Mars is different? Um, or have we, not, um, have, have we not made a proper map of Mars? Because the moon didn't look like the moon before we had Grail. The moon looked more like other terrestrial planets. And so, um, so I, I, I think we have to ask this question in thinking about internal structure. To what extent does our understanding of um, the internal structure of other, other planets uh, reflect um, inadequate, and I have on the chart here gravitational sampling, but, uh, but actually uh, you know, a, a really, really good seismic experiment is, is at least preferable, if not even more preferable. And, and that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about the, um, the uh, upcoming landing of the InSight mission um, on this. So I'll end now and open it up for questions. Um, just the, you know, the evidence for the, um, uh, you know, the broken crust is the high coherence, the lower than expected density, and the high porosity. Um, we could have actually some porosity in the mantle. There's no requirement that the lunar mantle be enriched in refractories. And then I've given you the constraints, the best constraints that we have on deep interior structures. So, um, so thank you, everybody, for listening. And, um, and I'll be happy to um, entertain any questions that people have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. That was really excellent. And uh, lots of uh, interesting questions for the future as well. So we have some questions here. And Ariel Deutsch will um, translate them. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Um, first, we have a general question regarding spherical harmonics. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit about how the spatial resolution of your measurements affects the Grail interpretation? Oh, the the um, okay. So um, so first of all, I guess you know I I guess I should have said this um, right at the beginning, but we use um, geophysicists um, use. Um, spherical harmonics because it's the solution for um, the equation that describes potential fields on a sphere. So it's essentially the spherical 
version of a Fourier transform, okay, if, if uh, in, in kind of one-dimensional or two-dimensional space. And, um, and so, um, so how, how does um, the, uh, uh, basically, how, are you asking how the sampling that we get in the spherical harmonic, how that affects our solutions? So, um, so, yeah. so, um, so I will say up to about, um, let me see, degree and order, like, I was somewhere between 700 and 900. Um, I will say we, we know the gravity field perfectly, okay? Um, so, so we've, we've fully sampled and we have, um, uh, we don't, we don't have unsampled areas and, and the resolution is good at when we, we get above, um, and that's, um, you know, that's on the order, that's about three and a half or four kilometers about, okay. okay. Um, in terms of spatial scale. Then when we, we get above that, um, then we, um, then, it, then it matters. We have very high resolutions in the areas where grail flew low um, and flew over places many, many times. Um, but in other areas, you know, at Spatial scales less than four kilometers. There, there are, you know, there can be a fair amount of artifacts. So, so like when you look at those, uh, when you look at the Bouguer gravity, that that in itself is kind of filtered. But you look at the gradient maps. There's, there's, um, there are a lot of artifacts in that. And so you, you, you have to be, um, you, you have to be pretty careful about interpreting them. So, so what. What I would recommend, there are, we have, we have a lot of papers out there and, um, and I want to call out, um, it's probably a good time for me to call out, we had, we had two gravity field modeling efforts going on. Um, one at the Goddard Space Flight Center that was led by, um, by Frank Lemoyne and Sandra Goosen and another um, out at JPL that was, uh, that was led by, um, Alex Konopolov and the Ning Yuan and Ryan Park and um, and uh, what uh, the JPL group was they they focused on taking things out to the highest spherical harmonic degree they could and uh, and in the Goddard modeling they looked at taking things out to lesser uh, less high spherical harmonic models but then doing regional modeling between the two. And then what we would do is we would make maps and compare them uh, and look at the different uh, high resolution structure. And so, um, so when we did those comparisons, that was something else that gave us a sense for how much spurious um, signal that we got there. So for example, um, if anybody cares to, um, you could look at the supplementary material on, um, on a paper in science that we wrote um, on doing a map of the Oriental Basin. And, um, and in, the, um, in, the, uh, in the supplementary material, you see two side-by-side -side figures, one that was made just with spherical harmonics and one that did solve through regional anomalies superimposed on the spherical harmonics. And, and we went out to as high degree in order we could where we couldn't see a difference between the two maps. And when we got to that point, that was what we published because we knew we would be okay. So if, if, you're, if you're interested in small scale structure, um, and I would say, um, uh, you know, one of the fantastic things about GRAIL was bringing geophysics down to spatial scales associated with geology so that you want to take advantage of that structure. Um, you can go into Frank's and Sanders and Deneen's and Alex's papers, and they have models of mapping altitude, and they um, they have models of uh, 
of looking at um, the quality of the, the spherical harmonic degree solutions. Um, and you can look at those and it'll, it'll give you a sense of where we have really trustworthy resolution. Okay. Our next question, you might have actually touched on this at the very end of your presentation. But at the beginning, you spoke about how one of the first discoveries of the GRAIL mission was the correlation between lunar topography and gravity. And we had an early question on whether this correlation was obser is observed on other terrestrial bodies. Yeah, well, um, not like that. <laughs> so <laughs> what, you, um, what, what, we, um, what we tend to see is um, there are some correlations or anti-correlations, um, and, and I'll talk about what that means in a minute, of um, at the very longest wavelengths. Um, so, um, so, so an, an anti-correlation would be, so if you had a mountain and then you had a crustal root beneath it, you know, that, um, uh, that would be an anti-correlation. But we don't, we don't see anything nearly like what uh, um, we see from GRAIL in terms of coherence at, uh, at crustal scales. And so, and, and, uh, and again, um, I really think we should, and, and you might have, you might have uh, surmised from my puzzlement um, that I really think we, we, sh we should see it for Mars and Mercury. Um, and Mercury, we don't, um, you know, mapping Mercury is a real challenge because of solar tides and being close to the sun. So, so it, it's really, it will be really hard to map low and, and you know, Mercury's hot. And so, uh, so as, as the messenger mission showed, um, you can block out the sun with a sunshade, but actually the, uh, the infrared emissions from the surface just kill you. Okay. So, um, so you, we're not going to be able to map really, really low on Mercury. So we're not going to be able to do a grail-like experiment in Mercury, not even you people coming into the field at the first time, you know, and who have many years left in your careers. That's just a very, very, very tough thermal problem. But on Mars, you know, with, the, with all of the emphasis on looking for repository, repositories of subsurface water on Mars, and we just had a great discovery of that reported recently, um, and looking for where the water went on Mars. You know, we know from MAVEN that a lot of it was lost to space, but clearly a lot of it went below the surface, and the, the surface should be fractured up, and it's a great reservoir, and we ought to be able to map what that reservoir was. And, um, and of course, you know, if we want to look for extant life, we want to look where the water is, and we, we're going to need to get beneath the surface. So I think the... Um, the habitability story for Mars really needs a, uh, a study, a de detailed, detailed study of crustal fracturing. And so, so imagine if we could do a map of the crust of Mars like we have mapped the, the crust of the moon. And, you know, Mars has an atmosphere, so you couldn't do quite that well, but, but you could probably do pretty good. And so, so I'm, betting, I'm betting Mars should be a lot more like the moon than what Mars looks like now. We also have a couple questions regarding mass distribution. And so the first is whether you would predict any long-term rotational or orbital effects from the asymmetry of the crustal thickness, and also whether this asymmetry might affect long-term surface topography. Um, let's see. So. Um, so the um, the asymmetry in crustal thickness um, does not um, affect the rotation because it is isostatically compensated, uh, or or nearly all isostatically compensated. So um, so for example, the the South Pole Aiken Basin um, is it's more than ninety percent um, compensated. And the, the the crust is it's essentially isostatic. So so that that very which means it it, it it's invisible gravitationally. However, um, 
However, uh, various studies um, have been done. Um, Ian Garrick Bethel has looked at this. James Keene has looked at this. Um, others have looked at this. Uh, um, looking at um, the possibilities of reorientation associated with the large impacts uh, and the um, and the Mari basalt uh, the Mari basalts because the the large basins the mascons and the large Mari basalt um, those are uncompensated so um, so that you know early early in lunar history uh, there could have been some effects there but um, but that but now now the moon is pretty much um, locked in to a um, to a minimum energy configuration. Um, last week, Mark was here and he was speaking about magma ocean um, hypotheses. Mm -hmm. We have a question on what a homogeneous gravity signature might suggest about possible overturn models. Oh wow, that's yeah. You know, I was uh, I really was I actually. <laughs> Originally had some charts in about overturn that I, I took out because of time, um, but the um, so the um, so so the homogenization of the crust um, I believe is a reflection of the mechanical state of the lunar crust rather than the chemical state of the lunar crust. So uh, so I believe the the overwhelming part of the, um, the homogenization is because of impact breakup and redistribution. Um, uh, how if and so if 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 one let's just say if the moon had an atmosphere or I mean the moon did have an atmosphere at one point had a steam atmosphere as uh, as Lindy Elkins Tanton and others have showed, but um, but earlier on if um, if, if one looked at like the early lunar crust before um, uh, all of the uh, impact homogenization occurred, um, that it would not have been um, that gravitationally homogeneous. Um, so I, um, I, because the uh, there, you know, the um, the magma ocean. Um, you know there are dynamics associated with the magma ocean, and and there have been models for stratification and the melting um, the melting over uh, the surface of the moon was not um, spatially homogeneous. So more areas were more melted than others, and so had you know different vertical distributions of uh, of the uh, um, mineral phases that were coming out. Um, so there, there would have been spatial variation. So, um, so I, I think um, the, the homogenization does not tell us about the overturn per se, but, um, but I, I think it would be um, interesting to go in and, um, and look at the crustal density slices as a function of depth, and then and then to maybe look at um, uh, compaction models or what one would expect to the um, uh, fracturing to be as a function of depth. And, um, and then to try to pull out any residual, sig you know, a, a background signal that isn't associated with fracturing. Now that would, that would take some assumptions and I'm not quite sure how well that would work, but uh, but it wouldn't be that hard to do, and it and it could be pretty interesting because maybe you know one one could potentially pull out some information about uh, how density is distributed with depth. So um, we also have a question on gradiometry. So uh, the question is why or how do you constrain the timing of the interpreted subsurface dikes beneath the maria? For example, would the subsurface dikes necessarily be indicative of early global expansion rather than expansion at some later time? Yeah, this this um, uh, so the early um, so so these these global dikes um, they had to be really 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 early 
okay, um, because um, they never got to the surface, okay, and you see them, you see them in areas of thin crust, and you see them in areas of thick crust, but you never see any of these dikes coming to the surface, okay, and um, and so what this indicates is that, um, and so one, I mean, I guess one could say maybe they, maybe just nothing ever got to the surface, but, you know, if, if they came from melting of the mantle, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine that they would have gotten up that far and then just not gotten um, any farther, okay? Um, and, uh, and one, you know, one can look at neutral buoyancy and things like that, but, um, but uh, uh, certainly Mare got to the surface. So, um, you know, so, th so there are ways for these melts to get to the surface. I, uh, so I, I tend to believe, and, and Jeff and our team, um, who, who discussed this at great length, um, believe that these did once come to the surface, but that the, uh, the impact, you know, the pervasive impacting of the lunar crust and the, you know, redistributing ejecta all over the place just just broke everything apart, broke these dikes apart, um, broke lunar crust apart, and then just redistributed everything so that you just don't see them. I mean, it's and people have looked for these. I mean, um, you could go back back to like the 1970s and, and um, uh, a prize for anybody who remembers this, but Paul Lohman, who was a uh, a member of the the Goddard Space Flight Center staff, and 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 actually others looked for a lunar grid. Um, so they were, you know, they were looking for evidence of uh, global stresses um, on the moon um, associated to you know various different mechanisms. But they, uh, you know, Paul looked at uh, lunar orbiter and other imagery, and he looked at it at all light angles, um, you know, trying to find evidence. Specifically for that, and um, and then um, and then you know now we have very very good lunar and he he, he actually to be fair uh, did think he saw some evidence for that others didn't see evidence for that but it's not what we wound up seeing and um, and now we have um, you know thanks to LROC, we have you know and just spectacular. Um, imagery of the lunar surface, and you know, and I should probably credit Kaguya and um, uh, and and other missions that ha that have also collected uh, uh, images that have contributed to the story as well. But we have we have very very good imaging of the moon now, and, and still we haven't seen any of this. So um, so the the best guess is that uh, that that whole, whole signal was wiped out, so it had to have occurred extremely early. Um, so this week, David Kring was out of the bombardment meeting in Arizona, and so he wanted to raise a couple of points of discussion that occurred there, um, specifically okay. related to gravity signatures of craters without to topographic expression. Mm -hmm. And so he writes in that two issues emerged in the discussion. So the first is, is there a cutoff in crater size below which an anomaly would not be produced? Um, that is, do anomalies provide an incomplete population of craters at some diameter? And then the oh, second okay. is, okay, don't okay. do that. Okay, okay the second so, so that was, okay, let, so let me do that, let me do that one first, because that's a, that's a okay. quick answer. So if, it, so if it's a crater on the surface, um, you know, so we're, you know, we're good down to say three kilometers, so, um, so, so craters, Craters with diameters um, less than six kilometers or radii of three kilometers, there's an incomplete sampling. So there is some there is some data better than that, but we don't have a full sampling. And um, um, and I think actually Jim, when you did your you did everything 15 kilometers and above, but the the data sets are better now than that. So um, you know using lower data there, but you can also use Grail. Okay, we'll take the next one. Also, I'd just add there that I think if, if you're talking about uh, really the major anomalies like um, peak ring basins and multi ring basins, then the cutoff would be a couple hundred kilometers that you wouldn't see that mantle uplift 
anomaly um, as coherently. You might see an anomaly related to basaltic filling of that crater, but not necessarily to, you know, at, at smaller diameters. Correct. Okay, and then the second is, are there other sources such as plutonic activity that could produce anomalies? Um, the Apollo samples indicate plutons exist, but how would you separate these from buried craters in gravity? Uh, okay, so that, that's a yeah, that's a really interesting question. So, um, so first of all, another another piece of information that uh, hit the cutting room floor in this talk was um, uh, Mike Sori's study of Cryptomaria. So he went in and looked at um, he looked at the Bouguer, the Grail Bouguer data, and um, and went in and looked for. Uh, gravitational signatures where there was no surface structure and um, and, and he also um, and he looked outside the Maria so he, he assumed that that uh, craters could be buried in Maria but that you weren't going to see a, a crater in mid crustal levels say at the um, uh, in the highlands and so um, so he found um, evidence for um, uh, for, for a lot of intrusion, and I, I think you know, found evidence for more intrusive volcanism than extrusive volcanism. Um, in fact, um, but when um, when we we look at the buried craters in the the Maria, um, yeah, this is this is Alex Evans's um, work, and um, and so. Uh, so, so basically, anything that was quasi-circular, Alex tagged as a uh, potential crater. I mean, if if something were circular, it would, and it were fully buried, it would be it would be hard to tell the difference. But in the in the highlands, you know, because the the crust is uh, is, is so fractured, uh, you know, you couldn't maintain a a buried crater there. So so anything that's a bouguet anomaly in the crust. Is, uh, is is an intrusion, and and I should say, you know, I mean, 98 and a half percent of the gravity is due to topography, but that means that um, uh, one and a half percent um, is not due to topography, and those are anomalies in the crust. So it makes it makes that one and a half percent of the the gravity signal. Exceedingly, exceedingly interesting, and I think there are more treasures to be uh, excavated um, from that from that one and a half percent. Okay, Maria, uh, I want to just close with a couple of questions here. You, um, I'm going to ask you a dream question. So, um, you've done. If NASA came to you and said you did such a great job on Grail, we want you to be PI of a mission to put a geophysical network on the moon, and you define what that should be, and we'll fly that. So the question is, would it be global geophysics, or would it be global and regional, or is there a particular area, uh, you know, that specifically might tell us more than global, some complementary thing? What would what would your dream be there? Uh, well, let's see. If I could, uh, let's see. If I if I could do anything, I would I would bring samples back from lots of places, right? Um, uh, so a, a a network that um, that returns samples and and you know, in, in particular, I still, I still, you know, this idea, we, we, you know, we've got a sample, um, the South Pole Aiken Basin, because it's the deepest part of the moon that we have, um, that we have access to. So, so for sure there, uh, but more highland samples. Um, and, um, and if I, if I get to put something on the lander before it brings the sample back, I'd, I'd, I'd put seismometers and heat flow probes um, on all of that to, to get the global um, seismic structure, and imagine doing a uh, global inversion of a really good seismic data set with the Grail gravity, um, that would be incredible. So. Okay, Maria, we really thank you very much for taking time out of your extremely busy day, and um, we uh, will, as is known, we will um, we tape the lecture and we'll put that online as well. And uh, we'd like to welcome you back in the future. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you, Jim, and thanks to everybody out there who tuned in. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.